Well, J.D., I know you've just recently written a book called Breaking the Islam Code. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote that book and then also maybe some practical ways we could reach out to Muslims in our own communities? Yeah. Why I wrote the book is because um, well, I spent two years as a church planner in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and um, Muslims became some of my very best friends. And so part of it is a personal passion for, for them. Um, part of it is because you know we see a looming interaction between the Western world and Islam. Uh, Muslims are moving here, and many Christians don't know how to reach out to this great faith. And I say great faith not in terms of it's an alternate way of salvation, but it great in terms of a, a ton of people. Um, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that goes on between Christians and Muslims. Uh, Muslims think that Christians are the people they see on MTV that have a cross, and you know, Christians think that Muslims are people who blow things up. And uh, while there are certainly examples of both in both cultures, there's this wide middle where there are people who just don't understand each other, and we need to be able to present the gospel to them in a way they understand. Uh, what I found was when I lived among Muslims was that I was, uh, to use a, a cliche, I was answering questions they weren't asking. Mm. And as a result, the gospel presentation um, it's not that it had no power, it's just that it did not connect with them. And so what this book does is it studies what is already there in Islam, what questions about God, about eternity, about sin, about Christ, what questions are already there that we can show how Islam doesn't give a satisfactory answer and that the gospel does give an answer. I'll give you a quick example. When I was... Um, uh, when I was there, uh, the way I presented the gospel, the way most Americans present the gospel is, is kind of this idea that we owed a debt we couldn't pay, so Jesus paid a debt he didn't know. Um, and that's great. It's true. But you present that to a Muslim, and they start hearing things like debt. How could God ever be in debt? Why does, I mean, God can do what he wants. If God wants to wipe out a debt, he can just be like, you know, be gone, and it's gone. And so it's not that it's not true. It's not that we shouldn't explain that to them. It's just that there was an obstacle there to them even you know, processing that. Well, on the other hand, um, Muslims pray five times a day. And every time they pray, they go through a washing process where they, I mean, it's pretty extensive. They've got to cleanse all defilement off of them. Um, you, one time I asked one of my Muslim friends who was about to go pray, I'm like, all right, what's the dirtiest thing that you could touch? And they were like, oh, a pig. I'm like, seriously, a pig is the dirtiest thing in God's eyes? They're like, yes. And like, you don't have to wash one time when you touch a pig. You have to wash seven times to get all that defilement off of you. I said, well, don't you think that adultery and idolatry would be dirtier, filthier in God's eyes than touching a pig would? And they were like, well, yeah, I, I guess it would. And I said, well, where does adultery and idolatry, where does that take place? And they were like, I guess that takes place in the heart. So the question I asked was, well, how do you cleanse the heart? And their response was, oh, well, you don't. You just repent and God forgives you. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You can't just repent of touching the pig and God forgive you. Mm -hmm. You repent and cleanse. Well, Christians believe the blood of Jesus is the cleansing that washes away the defilement of sin in our hearts. Mm -hmm. That happened because Jesus died a penal substitution in our place, but the cleansing metaphor, you know, it connects with them more than some of the other ways that we present the gospel to them. So I, I, in this book, I tried to, the Islamic code are the things that they're thinking about God that we can start with and use those things to preach the gospel to them in a way that connects in a way they understand. That's good. So as far as practically reaching out to Muslims in our own communities, what are some things we could do uh, immediately? Yeah, I mean, well, um, there's three things that missionaries say, um, that people who work among Muslims say, are, are one of these three things, if not all three, are instrumental in, in a Muslim coming to Christ. Um, the first one is the Word of God. Uh, I know that's a little cliche, but that's exactly what it is. They say that as Muslims begin to read the Bible. Um, not so much a four spiritual laws kind of presentation, but just inviting them to study the Bible with you. The Quran several times refers to the people of the previous book. In fact, in one place it says, if you have questions about the previous prophets, Adam, Noah, Moses, you know, the 23rd prophet is John the Baptist. The 24th prophet is Jesus. And it says, if you want to know about these other 24 prophets, go ask the people who are experts at the book before you. That's a great way to say, hey, why don't we study the prophets? Let's study the Bible together. And there's several Bible studies that I tell you about in my book that will help you walk a Muslim through, um, through the Bible. So just getting the Word of God in their hands. The second thing is that uh, they see the love in a Christian community. 
um, it's it's different than their communities because they see an acceptance, they see a brotherhood, and so it's really just making them your friend. As you know, most of the people who lead and are, are leaders in Muslim countries are educated in the United States. And I found this thing the other day, it just broke my heart. Most of the Muslims who live here, um, who, who study for four years here, will never step foot in, in an American home. Mm. Which means if you just befriend them and, and bring them into your community, we have a group of Muslims that come every week to our church. Well, every week. They come often to our church. And one of them, she comes in the full like regalia, and wow. she tells me that I am her Christian teacher because she, she wants to use her time in America to learn more about this. We'll just befriending them. Um, so that, that's the second thing. The Word of God, befriending them. The third thing is um, they say that, that Muslims quite often are visited with a supernatural dream or, re- or some type of vision. Uh, and I know for many people that makes them a little squeamish in their theology. It was that way for me, to be honest, when I first started this. But I'm going to tell you, of most, most of the Muslims I have seen personally come to Christ, um, most of them came through the catalyst of some kind of vision they had wow. where Jesus or a prophet or somebody you know, made something known to them. I mean, some of them are like blow your mind kind of stuff. Wow. Like, the kind of things that if you told me, I wouldn't believe you. But because I saw it firsthand, I, I really can't deny it. So you just pray. You pray that God will do what you cannot do in, in, in awakening them. Um, I heard uh, Peter Kreeft say the other day, and I thought this was great. Um, the next Apostle Paul is probably right now a Muslim. And somewhere, God's going to about to knock him off his horse, and that one who who will begin to preach the faith he once destroyed. And that's exciting for me just to pray about and be like, I, I want to be instrumental in that prayer, and I hope this book is instrumental in helping that happen.